Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the NWSA webinar series. I'm Dave Cantrell, NWSA's Programs Chair. We present our webinars in collaboration with the Partnership for the National Trails System as a resource for your organization. We're fortunate to have with us today Julie King, National Wilderness Character Monitoring Program Manager for the Forest Service. Julie will explain what we are learning from pilot WCM programs and look ahead to how we can manage our local wilderness character monitoring efforts through programs like NWSA's Wilderness Stewardship Performance Grants. If you have questions as Julie speaks, please use your GoToMeeting dashboard and we'll save time for her to answer them at the end. If you have technical problems, please use the chat function and we'll try to help. Now it's a pleasure to introduce Julie King and her colleagues to give us an update on wilderness character monitoring in the Forest Service. Okay, well thanks so much, David, and um, we're really glad to join you this afternoon and to be able to talk about wilderness character monitoring and kind of where we're at in the Forest Service. So I have at the last minute had some um, computer issues. I'm kind of getting the blue screen of death here. So we have a plan for Mike Smith, who's also on the call, um, to present our PowerPoint. And I will be able to add items, answer questions. Um, Mike is one of our WCM leaders uh, working for Society of Wilderness Stewards. And then we also have Jim Edmonds, who's our central data analyst um, for our core team. And we have Kate Devrona, who is another WCM leader working for Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. So we're really glad to have um, the whole WCM team um, on board. And we do have a PowerPoint that's going to kind of take you through kind of the, the basics initially about um, why are we doing wilderness character monitoring? Where does it come from? Um, what are the you know interagency kind of agreements and consistency that are going on? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and I believe the PowerPoint is up. So I'm going to ask uh, Mike Smith and Jim Edmonds to take us through the PowerPoint and I, I will add in and be here available for questions. Okay, guys, take it away. All right, thanks, Julie. Um, so yeah, this is Mike Smith. I'm on the WCM Central team, and uh, I'll I'll be giving uh, this presentation with uh, due to just some technical difficulties here. Uh, so yeah, I uh, I'm not actually controlling the PowerPoint, so it might might be a little clunky here, but we'll try to get through it. Um, so yeah, here's kind of, this is a presentation we've done before a number of times, um, just kind of a good inclusive introduction to wilderness character monitoring for this year for FY19. Um, and yeah, that date's a little outdated there, but, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide. So why are we here today? I'll Go through kind of generally what we're gonna what I'll what I'll be talking about in this little presentation. Uh, this is the second year of uh, Forest Service WCM. I'm gonna I'll probably say WCM a lot more than Wilderness Character Monitoring, just FYI. Uh, but yeah, so this is the second year of WCM implementation. We had a successful pilot year last year, which uh, we completed baseline assessments for 30 wilderness areas, and um, you're not sure what the baseline assessment term means i'll be getting into it a lot more later uh this year we're scheduled to complete about 60 baseline assessments um sort of figure that out a little bit i think we're pretty set on around 60 now um so the goal of this presentation is to talk about why we're doing wilderness character monitoring how to get started at the local unit and who's going to do which tasks which i think is pretty important for everyone and then I'll, at the end, we'll, I'll talk about where, maybe the most important, where to get more information, additional assistance. All right. Um, so here's a breakdown of the, what I called the, what we call the pilot year. This is our first year of WCM implementation. Um, 
as you can see, we're kind of ramping it up a bit this year because last year we had 30, and now we're doubling it about. Um, but, yeah, here's a look at all of the 30 baseline assessments that were completed. And um, as you can see, they range across all regions in the whole forest therapy system. Now I'll go to the next one. So this is for this year. Um, as you can see, we have these 60 here. And again, uh, they're spread out across all the regions in the system. And um, it's still, I think now these are pretty much clear. There might be a few differences, but that gives you a pretty good breakdown and everything. Now right, we'll go on to the next slide. All right, so um, we're going to get more into the actual background of wilderness character monitoring. So to start out answering the question where it all came from, uh, I'm going to imagine most people here have heard of the term wilderness character, but a quick review here. Um, legal scholars state that these two clauses from the Wilderness Act assert affirmative management responsibility for, for preserving wilderness character. Um, so in other words, this is the primary job of agencies who manage wilderness. And yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, not only is it written in the Wilderness Act, but all four agencies have explicit policies to uphold that mandate to preserve wilderness character. So the congressional mandate to preserve wilderness character um, each agency, Fish and Wildlife, National Park Service, BLM, Forest Service, they each have their own kind of policies. But in the end, they're all doing the same thing. Well, they should be doing all the same thing. That's what we're checking here with wilderness character monitoring um, to preserve wilderness character. Wilderness character. So if you guys have seen 2320, that's, the, uh, that's where it's written in the Forest Service policy. And again, the law and policy are very clear. This is the primary affirmative mandate for managing wilderness. All right, we're gonna move on. So here's kind of um, a little bit of history, I guess we'll say, of where where we've come from and to where we are today, essentially. So WCM started in 2009, and based on this experience, the Aldo Leopold Wilderness Research Institute pulled together an interagency team to review the questions and problems raised during the initial implementation time. The goal of this team was to resolve all these questions and produce a new lessons learned document to provide improved guidance for WCM. And that kind of guidance document is what would later become known as Keeping a Wild 2. And since Keeping a Wild 2 was published, all the agencies have continued working on their WCM programs to one degree or another. Uh, the Forest Service updated our technical guide last year, and that was followed by, as I mentioned, the pilot year in 2018, and we're still updating the tech guide now. Um, but anyway, that's just a little idea of what's going on. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so I'll be on this grouping. This kind of has a, some animations and things. I'll be talking about this conceptual diagram for a while because I think it's really the best, kind of the best way to help understand the purpose and you know why we're doing WCM. Um, so I'll walk, kind of walk you guys through what what's going on here. Kind of get it's not too hard, but I'll get I'll describe it a little bit more. So. The blue, that blue box there is showing the state of wilderness character at the time an area was designated. And this state of wilderness character can be anywhere along this line because Congress determined that the area should be, well, when Congress determined when that area should be designated. So um, at the time of designation, it doesn't really matter where it is in the line. Um, for some context, a large remote wilderness may be in the upper left, upper left portion. Um, and then a more, let's say, mined or logged, smaller wilderness, near maybe near a city, that's going to be closer to 
the lower right at the time of wilderness character designation. Um, and again, where the blue box is when the area is designated is uh, it doesn't matter. Once an area is designated as wilderness, the job is to keep the box from sliding down the line. So I'll repeat that again because that's kind of the main point here of wilderness character monitoring. The job is to keep once it's designated, once it has a designated state of uh, of character uh, wilderness character state. The job is to keep the box from sliding down the line. Um, and so what WCM is doing is going is asking where the box is initially at the time of uh, wilderness character or the time of designation, which wilderness character is, and then we want to know which direction it's headed. And this all came about because um, in the last 50 years we've been managing wilderness areas but haven't really been collecting any sort of consistent and objective data to tell us whether or not we're actually managing to fulfill that mandate I mentioned earlier, whether or not we are in fact preserving wilderness character, which is the whole goal of everything. So Jim, if you click here, we'll, we'll start one of the, the animations here. There we go. Um, so yeah, we're making it a little more complicated here. Each colored box shows a state of wilderness character for a different wilderness area. So as you can see, some are less degraded, like say the, the, the green and the blue, and then some are more degraded, like the red and the purple. Um, but all are showing the state of wilderness character at the time of designation. So this is just whenever, whatever year it was decided they would be uh, part of the National Wilderness Preservation System, this is where they are as far as their wilderness character. All right, one more click here. So only by monitoring can we understand whether this congressionally defined state of wilderness character is stable. In the case of that yellow arrow, it's improving. In the case of the green and the purple arrows or degrading in the case of the blue and the red arrows. So this is really important. The intention of wilderness character monitoring is not to compare wilderness character in one wilderness to the wilderness character of another wilderness. So. Um, you know, practically, you can see that just thinking about, for example, um, let's say that the red wilderness is right outside New York City, like the Great Swamp Wilderness. Um, it's never going to be the same wilderness character as, say, the Gates of the Arctic, which might be like the green one here. We're not trying to uh, hold all these wilderness areas to a single standard. Um, yeah, so that's really important to remember. What we will be able to do is compare trends themselves, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. It doesn't really matter where on the line you start, as I said, as long as the trends in wilderness character are stable and improving. So that's the whole game here. We're trying to find out where they are on the spectrum, and then we're trying to at least keep um, the wilderness character stable, if not improve it. Uh, we, but at least we'll know if it's degrading, too. Um, so the baseline point for evaluating trends in the wilderness character would ideally be the year the wilderness is designated. So for example, 1964, let's say for one of these wilderness areas, but uh, I'm sure you guys know, will understand it's going to be very hard to find uh, adequate data going back that far. Um, so yeah, so almost no wilderness areas have data dating back that far for all of their selected measures, which we'll talk about. So for all intents and purposes, the baseline year for which is the year which um, data are available for every measure, which will generally be the year WCM is implemented. So that's the reason why we're seeing, you know, 2018 is the pilot year. As the pilot year, that's going to be the year that um, that wilderness areas have data for all the measures they are selecting. Um, and just a side note, the Keeping Wild 2. WCM framework is important because it gives a structure to tangibly evaluate where these boxes are or essentially what the baseline is and how it will change in the future. So basically what Keeping a Wild 2 does is give us a standard you know, method of comparing uh, trends amongst themselves. Um, all right, we'll move on from here. So here's the list of goals for WCM, um, and I'll go through each one of these bullets in a little more detail. 
uh, but they each represent a distinct goal. So the first bullet, this is really important. This is kind of an issue that had been coming up a lot. Um, if, if WCM were not locally relevant, there wouldn't be much incentive for local staff to be engaged. And if it weren't nationally consistent, then there wouldn't be much incentive for national program leaders to support it. Um, and we'll see through the measure system that WCM does both. And then the second bullet, uh, I kind of alluded to this before, but managers have complained for years that they lack a way or tool to show accomplishments in preserving wilderness character. And WCM provides just that tool. Moving on if, to the third, if wilderness character is degrading, it might be because the policy is not very good, or it might be because the policy is really good, but it's not being implemented well. It's ex the execution, execution problem. So luckily with WCM, this type of information uh, can really gauge the effectiveness of agency policies. And then moving to the fourth bullet, this is a very big issue here. Um, so I'm sure as people have known, personnel are constantly changing. And when a new person starts working at Wilderness, the, the, the conditions they see become their default or the baseline for what they know. Um, so that's all they've seen since they started. But they might be working with someone or someone may have worked there that was has been there for 20 years. And they'll have seen that the area has dramatically changed. So the difference in perception of these two people is what we call a shifting baseline. It can be a really big problem. So only by collecting and storing information can the agencies work toward overcoming the problem of shifting baselines. And then lastly, uh, most agency wilderness programs are not well funded or staffed. So the only way a wilderness character monitoring or WCM can be accomplished is by um, complementing existing agency programs and using appropriate existing data as much as possible. So for example, all agencies are gonna have natural resource data collection, they have systems already in place, and so this data could and should be used for measures that are part of wilderness character monitoring. So the idea is here, we're trying to eliminate uh, duplication as much as possible, trying to use data monitoring that's already in place and use it for WCM. All right, we'll move on. So this is a slide we saw quite a bit during the SWS training. Um, it's really important because you, know, you might get the question, well, how does this differ from WSP or something like that? Um, so when we usually think about WCM, it is in the context of the, of the Forest Service today. We usually think about it in association with uh, wilderness stewardship performance. So that's because WCM is one of the required elements that wilderness areas must select in WSP. So WSP is going to focus on what kind of stewardship actions the wilderness is completing to preserve uh, wilderness character, while WCM focuses on the outcomes for wilderness character from those stewardship actions and things outside of managerial control. So it's important to stress here that WCM is a component of WSP and it's looking at the outcomes of what WSP is actually doing. So WSP is the actions uh, and then WCM is looking at, you know, what happened because of those actions. So try to eliminate confusion there as much as I can, but um, yeah, that's this is a good slide. This can be available. We'll get into it later as far as information, but this all these slides are going to be available later uh, to look at. All right, we'll move on from here. All right, so here's a general look at the WSP, um, where WCM fits into WSP. Uh, it includes five steps from two points to ten points. We'll say that quite a bit, two point, four point, six point, eight point, ten point. Um, some units are completing baselines this year and they've already done two and four. The steps that are that constitute two and four, while others might be doing the steps two through eight. So the two point score, you can see it here. It's going to cloud. I'll talk about all this in a little more detail uh, shortly, but two point includes compiling legislative and administrative documentation and storing it in the central repository. The four point is going to be the wilderness character narrative 
The sixth point includes selecting measures that a wilderness will monitor over time. And then the eighth point is establishing a wilderness character baseline um, through developing a baseline assessment report. And that's kind of the big, what things are leading to for each year of WCM. And then lastly, the 10 point is measuring trends in at least five years after the baseline assessment. So the idea is if you were doing, um, well, so for the pilot years, you would check back on the trend in 2023, and that, then the 10-point would come in. Uh, all right, so we'll move on to the two-point. So yeah, the two-point is pretty much kind of exactly what it sounds like, just compiling legislative and administrative documents um, that are wilderness you know, related and putting them into a central repository. And we want to include all the relevant information and then organize the documents by wilderness quality in a file structure seen here. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. If you see um, if you see a document that has to do with your wilderness um, that's talking about the wildlife species or vegetation, you put it into the natural quality in the central repository. And then we have some examples of uh, of documents you might see or you could ask somebody to look at that would be relevant. And then the next slide will show a uh, quick reference guide. So it's really important for you, for anybody doing it, and then for most more important for for um, other people that might want to see some information you've compiled. This is a quick reference guide. You can put an Excel document indicates what kind of information each document contains as well as where it's located as seen here. So yeah, that's a good idea, a good kind of way to keep organized and later so other people, you know, if they just want to see something specific, they don't have to go through all of your documents. They can look at this kind of reference guide here and um, find things a little bit faster. All right, we'll move on to the narrative. So the narrative, the four point is called, um, is really the only opportunity to develop and present a holistic view of wilderness character that includes the intangible aspects of wilderness character. So that's really important. When we're talking about that baseline assessment report and kind of wilderness character monitoring in general, we're not talking as much about the intangible aspects of the wilderness, which are as important, but we don't really have the methods or tools right now to quantify um, aspects of intangible aspects of the of the um, wilderness so this is your place to add things like that like the sense of place symbolic spiritual values so um, it takes yeah so it takes on a, a greater importance because we'll see monitoring will divide the wilderness character into component parts such as the measures and uh, makes it easy when you're just looking at individual quantifiable measures to lose the big picture big picture that the narrative provides it also serves as a touchstone for planning, monitoring, decision making, and informs which measures should be selected for monitoring. So there's a reason why we're calling it four points. It's kind of in between after you've collected the um, documents and, and the legislative information, you can go on to the narrative. And the narrative then will give the person working on the six point, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, some more background information so they can have a better idea of what measures to select. So yeah, we'll move on to the sixth point here. Yeah, so here's the six point measure selection form. Um, you must select at least 15 of 28 potential measures. And I say potential because there could be uh, locally developed measures, for example, but 28 are the given four service measures that have been um, generated. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the measure selection form must be improved and signed by the forest supervisor and the regional program manager. Um, we're kind of changing that now. It can be signed by the district ranger, so just keep that in mind. But we have a well, I'll get into it later, but we have a document that kind of talks all through but through that section of kind of when to know when you're done type of thing. All right, I'll move on to the eight point. 
So this is what it's all about here. The eight point is the baseline assessment report it consists of the tangible practical aspects of what else that we can collect objective numbers on. Um, it's going to present qualitative data or yeah, quantitative data for wilderness uses that data going back to designation or as far back as there's data to set a baseline. So I talked about that before. Um, the reason why most wilderness areas are going to have a 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, onward baseline assessment, that'll be the years because that's when they have data for all of the measures. So in five years, the baseline will be revisited and a trend will be established for wilderness characters. So that's kind of where things are going. We'll go on to the next slide. So here's a, this table is going to lay out rough, uh, roughly, can underline that word roughly here, how much time it takes to complete each of the wilderness character monitoring steps. This is from our pilot year. We kind of thought about generally how long it took for each um, for each local unit to go through the WCM process and this is kind of what we came up with. Um, important to note that the review period as you can see might take longer than expected. Uh, this is because most of the local units that have helped put the reports together want to review the reports before they go to the forest supervisor for the signature. So there's multiple people in the forest service that are going to want to look at these type of products before they're going up later to get signed by the forest supervisor or regional program managers. All right, we'll go on to the next slide here. Um, so now we're kind of getting more into the details of wilderness character monitoring. Um, so we've, we've heard about the final product, so the question is how do we actually go about doing it? The broad idea of wilderness characters divided into progressively finer and more detailed level, levels, ultimately ending at measures that are aspects of the wilderness that data can be collected on. These measures can in turn be combined back through the hierarchy to directly relate to qualities of wilderness character. Um, so yeah, I, I mentioned before how they're locally relevant and nationally consistent. Well, the measures are capturing that locally relevant part, and then everything else, indicators, monitoring questions, qualities, and general wilderness character, that's the national consistent part. So within this wilderness, wilderness character monitoring framework, the definition of wilderness character, qualities, monitoring questions, and indicators are all nationally consistent with the Keeping a Wild, Interagency Keeping a Wild to a publication. So that's important too to mention, just that um, this part of the equation is shared with all four agencies. Um, and then, yeah, the, the measures are going to add in that local relevancy, the local flexibility. Um, that way we're able to keep things applicable for every wilderness across all the regions. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. So this shows how one quality, in this case, solitude of primitive and unconfined recreation is divided first in the monitoring questions. We, we see there's two. And then as those monitoring questions are divided into indicators, we have four. And then those are in turn divided into all these measures. And the minimum requirement for WCM is to have at least one measure per selected indicator. Um, as you can see, often there's more than one measure per indicator, but that's the minimum. And yeah, we'll move on from here. So I mentioned before, there's 28 measures that can be selected for WCM. Of these 28, 10 are required measures, include things like acres of base of plant species and an index of encounters. They go on from there, but um, yeah, so 10 are kind of deemed, you know, no, no real option there, they are required. Um, 14 of the 28 are required to select at least one measure in which wilderness areas can select, or yeah, wilderness can select the most relevant or multiple relevant measures. At the top of the table, you can see that there are three required to select at least one measures. And then these, yeah, so these include what we have here, um, index of recreation sites and primary use areas, they go to wilderness way. Anyway, those, um, um, those you just have to decide you have to select one of them and then you'd work with the local forest service staff to kind of decide 
which one or if multiple select. Um, and then we have two measures that are required if relevant. And um, uh, yeah, see, yeah, so two requires required if relevant, and those include other features of value measures, which are integral cultural features and integral other site specific features. Then the final two measures are optional and are two undeveloped measures and are only cho chosen if relevant. All right, we'll go on to the next slide. Yeah, so this is showing an example. Uh, you guys can look through these. This is just all um, all of the measures, all the 28 measures. Uh, and then look to the far right, you can see if they're required, if they're required to select at least one, if they're optional, required if relevant. So we'll skip through to the next slide from here. And yeah, we'll go. Go through and go through another time because that's it for that. Um, so here, this is actually kind of important. Who's going to actually do the work? Um, so the answer is here. The we have during the pilot year only eight of the thirty wilderness areas that were part of it that completed based on assessments uh, did so without the help of partner groups. So these eight wildernesses that didn't use partners had an array of staff to work on WCM, including, for example, wilderness managers, rangers, range staff, um, a team of staff, basically kind of anybody they could pull to work on this, they could, they, they would. Um, partner groups have an advantage, and the partner groups here we have listed, Society for Wilderness Stewardship, and SAW, Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, or Specialists, um, and New Mexico Wild, these are the kind of the three main that worked on things last year and upcoming this year. And it looks like for this year, at least half of the wilderness areas are completing baseline assessments. I think it might actually be more now. Um, so yeah, the advantage with partner groups working on all this is just that it's their only, it's their only assignment. They don't have 10 other, 15 other things going on. So they'll have a little bit more time or a lot more time to work on um each of these parts let's move on to the next slide uh yeah so the central team so yeah moving on we'll introduce kind of ourselves we've already been introduced a little bit um so here are the tools the number one is the wilderness character monitoring technical guide i talked about that briefly that was being updated um it really has everything you need to know about WCM, so I always talk about it as kind of the first place to go with any questions. Um, good, more than likely, your answer is in the wilderness technical. Is in the uh, technical guide. Um, it's going to be broken down into two parts. The first describes wilderness character monitoring and why it's important. Uh, yeah, that for an actual kind of like when you're when when someone's actually doing the work, you're not going to look at that as much. The second part is where you're going to want to look more for the implementation protocols, detailed step-by-step -step instructions for each measure. So it'll describe how to collect, process, interpret, and store data. So yeah, the second part of the tech guide is very important. Um, the next tool here is the NRM, WCM, and uh, it's going to pull data from other NRM, NRM modules and the national data set for 13 measures, including measures such as commercial livestock, uh, acres of inholdings and index of visitor management restrictions and others like that. Um, so, which is important to note there with the WCM NRM is that the values are only as good as the original source data. And sometimes we've seen, well, often we've seen that there's some issues with the information pulled. So that's why every NRM WCM measure must be verified. Which will should be on the next slide, I believe. Oh, this is just going through. Yeah, we'll skip through. I just talked about this, so we skip. We'll skip through this part, the tech guy, and, and that's what I talked about here. Here's where we're going through um, correcting data. Um, so I think go go through. Uh, click next one more time, Jim. 
let's see, let's see what I have here. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this case is an example from the Boundary Waters. And um, let's see, yeah, it's pulling data of index of developed trails for the Boundary Waters. I, well, this looks like it might be visitor restrictions. Um, anyway, the basic point here is that um, during the pilot year, most wilderness areas experienced at least one issue with the data in interim WCM. So big thing here is to a lot time to correct data. And um, it's important to know that you have to correct data at the source. So uh, if there's a trouble, if there's trouble with the trails, for example, that with that module, you'd have to correct the data in NRM trails. Um, so yeah, move on to the next slide. Okay, that's the Corona WCMD. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll we can kind of talk about issues with correcting data in the NRM WCM. You know, if it's relevant for people, um, we'll just say for now uh, there's a lot of help <laughs> for for in the central team with that because it's very likely it might happen. So if it does, um, we can help you through that. Um, yeah, so moving on to the WCMD, the Wilderness Character Monitoring Database. This is interagency. Uh, all, four year, all four agencies are going to use it. And basically, this is kind of like the final resting place, essentially, for the data that was compiled for the baseline assessment. And um, it gets later entered into WCMD. Central team will complete that, so Kate or myself can add, can add the data into WCMD. Um, so after you're done with the baseline assessment, this is kind of the last step, or one of the last steps. All right, move on to a little more about the central team. The next slide. So um, I kind of we kind of been throwing around some names here. Uh, the central team is comprised comprised of the WCM program manager, that's Julie, and then there's the central data analyst, that's Jim Jim Evans. Julie King, program manager, and data analyst Jim Edmonds, and then the two WCM leaders are myself, Mike, and Kate DeVerona. And um, yeah, here's kind of a talk about what we can do for you. So Jim can pull nine of the measures from national data sets. Uh, these include air and water quality measures as well as some GIS measures. We have a uh, I'll talk about it in a minute the opinion, and we have a document that shows all nine um, measures that Jim can pull from national data sets. Uh, we also provide technical assistance with all the measures, enter data in the WC, as I mentioned, and review narratives, baseline assessment reports, answer questions, that kind of thing. We hold office hours every other Tuesday for uh, the for service, and then uh, we have also have a partner call in the Tuesdays in between for for well for the partners. Um, so that's a good chance for anyone to call in with questions about WCM or just to listen in. And then I think the next slide might be talking about opinion. Oh, oh, here's yeah, here's a little more information. Those dates are a little bit outdated, <laughs> uh, but the basic idea is they're every other Tuesday for the office hours that uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, so yeah, 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, and there, that's all accurate, common code, passcode. And yeah, good time to, good place if you have something that you think is kind of tough to ask in email format, you want to talk to somebody, you know, or you just want to hear other people ask their questions, that's a really good time for that. So move on to the next slide. Ah, here's the opinion stuff. So a um, lot of great resources, including guides for each step in the whole process. So kind of everything I went through pretty fast, there's much more in-depth step-by-step guides. Uh, templates, so like a template for the measure selection form, the baseline assessment report, um, and uh, examples from past 
baseline assessment reports, past measure selection forms, past narratives, past two-point um, administrative and legislative documentation compilations. There's data. There's a database of how-to guides, webinars, and training presentations, including this one, and any other interagency resources. So, yeah. It, so the main point is, Pinion has a lot of help. So, in the whole kind of stretch or process of things, if you come across a question, first place would be the um, the technical guide, which I mentioned, which is also on Pinion, which is pretty convenient. And then if you don't really see the answer in the technical guide, you can look, cruise around Pinion, look to see if you have it there. Not that, then you can always reach us at the PDL um, email, which was on one of these slides here earlier. And that PDL email goes to everybody on the central team. So, you know, you're likely to get an answer pretty fast. Um, and yeah, that's, that's Pinion. Um, a lot of great information there. And uh, yeah, to get on to Pinion, you can email my. You can email email that PDL, and we'll get everyone set up. All right, we'll go on to the next slide. All right, so a recap of everything. Um, I guess this might be a multiple click one here, Jim. Um, overview, yeah, so. Overview of all the steps needed to complete up to the eight-point level for the wilderness character baseline assessment. Um, this is just here for your review. Maybe you know back later. This is just kind of show what we've been talking about. Um, and then just for extra information, I can think of the next slide. Here we have lessons learned. Yeah, here we go. Um, so lessons learned from last year, I mentioned it before, review your data early in WN, WN, or NRM WCM, because sometimes it'll take a little while to figure out how to fix your data and to get in contact with the data steward who can fix it. So uh, that's really important. Just, um, you know, don't wait, don't wait until uh, the end of the fiscal year to check the data accuracy because like I've been mentioning, we had a few issues, well, a lot of issues last year. So um, try to look up, try to look at that as soon as people can. Um, and we found that the winners did the best work in 2018 had a dedicated partner um, or forest service staff. So I mentioned that before. Um, WCM can be fairly time intensive, so it helps for whoever is working on it to not have. 10 other competing priorities in order to finish the work up on time. That's pretty, you know, common sense. And then last year, of all the WCM work was completed during the field season, or was completed the field season, which it looks like it's going to happen again. Unfortunately, we tried to make it earlier, but that can make it diff difficult for partners or staff to get in touch with resource special specialists in order to track down data for the baseline system or interview them for the narrative. So, yeah, I ran into that when I was a when I was a fellow, um, it's just basically the advice here is try to get in touch with people earlier uh, because they might leave for the whole the whole summer and it might already be too late. Uh, but that's just to know, like, you know, again, don't put things off. Um, all right, we'll go to the next slide from there. All right, this is kind of just the filler slide, so I'm going to come through. Uh, anyway, this is to kind of introduce where this is all going. Um, so we're not really concerned with this at the moment. It's five years later, but it's good to know, you know, why we're we're doing all this, where it's leading to. Um, so five years after completing the baseline assessment, trends for each measure uh, are established. The first thing we'll do is add up all the trends for the for the measures, and that'll give us the indicators, and then we'll click from there. Go from there to the the uh, questions, um, and then you add up all those. You get the qualities. You add up all the qualities, trends, and you get the final trend of the wilderness character. So that's where everything's leading to. So we're going. I, I talked earlier about kind of going in through back through the hierarchy. Well, this is what I'm talking about. We went down to the hierarchy to the measures, and then once we had all the trends of the measures, we took that back up all the way back up to the wilderness character. 
And this is what we hope to see in five years. Uh, so 2023 for the 2018 pilot wilderness areas, we'd hope to see that they're improving um, or they're staying the same or they're degrading. Either way, we'll know at least, which is different from what we've been doing. Um, yeah, so we'll click from here to kind of a general. Uh, yeah, so the wildernesses can be looked at across the regional level, which is going to show those trends across all the wildernesses within each region. And then from there, the next slide should show the national report. Yeah, so national report, that's kind of, we're just kind of just adding up what we did before. So the national report is adding up everything in the region. And then that's going to show, you know, for eventually the goal is to look at trends for every single wilderness in the whole national wilderness preservation system. So including all the other three agencies, but um, for now, just looking at the forest service, we go to the national port and then next slide. Let's see. Yeah, that's it. So, um, yeah, so that was just kind of like a general, um, look at where where we are uh what the tasks are kind of a little more detail on um, each step of everything i kind of went through it kind of fast so uh, again everything here that i talked about is online is online on pinion in much much graver detail so um with that i'll open it back up to questions that people might have Well, thanks, Jim, Julie, and Kate for the presentation. We do have a couple of questions uh, which have to do with access to information. Where can we see a list of the 60 wildernesses doing WCM in the upcoming work? Where can we see access to the studies done in 2018? And so this is Julie, and I'll just jump on. Um, so currently, you know, we do have the, the baselines from 2018, and we've uploaded them internally um, to Pinion. Um, you know, in five years, we'll repeat those and, and have the trend reports. So right now, that's kind of the status. I'm working with an interagency committee that, that has Park Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, USGS, we're, we're all looking at ways to share this information, I guess, with the larger public to, you know, perhaps post some things on wilderness.net that folks can access. Um, you know, currently right now, it, it's not in a public format um, for folks to access. So we have kind of dealt with some requests, you know, case by case, and then we're working on a larger communication plan to um, share the information that's been gathered and, you know, with um, wilderness entities as well as with the public. So does that help or is there something more specific um, that's being looked at there? Let's give uh, the people who ask those questions a chance to come back. In the meantime, we're asked as a potential Forest Service partner, would we simply connect with our local field office to determine how to get involved, how to provide services? Um, I would say yes, that would be uh, one way. Another way is to uh, contact me, um, Julie King, and I can share my email address with, with David. You all could uh, feel free to contact me. Um, we are in the process of, of having an in totally Forest Service um, core team. So I, I'm going to be probably around September We'll have an outreach for um, two WCM leader positions um, that will be internal to the to the Forest Service. Um, anyone who would be interested in that, feel free to contact me so I can include you on that outreach. So, you know, as far as how are we going to work with partners into the future, um, that's still kind of evolving and developing. Um, but into the near future, uh, we won't be you know, employing our um, WCM leaders um, through wilderness groups. But there still likely will be lots of Forest Service units who are looking for fellows um, to help them get this work done. And so I think it would be great 
for folks to contact their local Forest Service office um, to see what's going on, um, to get on a, a list or consideration, and then, you know, make me aware because maybe I can help um, connect some things. Sounds good, thanks. Um, one person has come back uh, not looking for the reports, just awareness of which wildernesses are going to be involved, which 60 wildernesses. Oh, okay. All right, gotcha. So, yes, we do have that, and, um, and I would believe that we would be able to share that because then that would give you some idea of who might be looking for help. Um, so maybe, Mike, I'll ask you um, to help me with that. Maybe we can get a, an email or just send stuff to Dave that he could share with folks. Um, you know, as soon as we could access that, we could sure uh, send it out and get it to you. Great. Yeah, if you'd run that through me, we can get it posted to the NWSA website. Okay. Not seeing any other questions coming in here. Just a thank you and another thank you. Yeah. So a couple of people are going to contact you directly, Julie. Okay, um, that sounds awesome. I welcome that. And I guess maybe just in closing, um, you know, we touched on the interagency aspect of WCM a bit, but I think it's a real strength. And I really think there's a lot of foresight, you know, and proactive thinking amongst the wilderness you know, um, directors, managers, and all the agencies to recognize that we really need to be on the same page with each other and that there's strength in, in our consistency and our approach and that we can leverage that. Um, and I'm seeing that happen, and and I think that's, that's a really positive piece to this. The Forest Service is the largest wilderness management agency, you know, with over 400 um, wilderness units, but these other agencies manage as well. And so, um, you know, into the future, we're going to be able to look at what that trend information looks like over larger landscapes. And it's truly my hope that, you know, decision makers and local land managers will be able to use this information to make sound decisions, you know, as we move forward into the future and uh, try to preserve wilderness character. So really appreciate this time with you all and welcome questions. Feel free to zip me an email. Um, and we can continue the discussion. Terrific. Thanks you all. Thanks to all of you so much. This has been very helpful and very interesting. Uh, a reminder to everyone that a recording of this webinar and all of our previous webinars is available through the NWSA website, and that you can also go to the website to learn about future presentations. So. Not seeing any further questions. Thank you all for your participation. We'll see you next time around. Thank you.